Good morning to you, church. It is awesome to be with you. Um, Pastor Doug will be returning next weekend, and so uh, once again, you are going to have to put up with me. But uh, you ever have those messages that, well, awesome. Um, that's very kind of you. I am uh, excited. You ever, there's these messages sometimes where you're just kind of, you're, you feel like you're out in the starting line and you're just wanting for that gun to go off so that you can get up and, and, and start to run. That's kind of how I feel about this message this morning. So I'm very excited to get into this word with you guys and um, just want to uh, just give you guys a reminder if any of you are part of our Saturday night crowd, next Saturday will be our last Saturday night service and we'll be moving all of our services to Sunday morning. So just so you guys are all aware of that. And uh, just again, thank you for your participation in this church and, and for your giving and for all the things that uh, you do and that we get to do together as the body of Christ. Um, we are beginning a new series this morning and Pastor Doug is going to be uh, going into a number of the different absolutes and things that we believe uh, based upon uh, the scripture. But this morning we're gonna lay a foundation for why we can believe in God and why we can trust and believe in his word. And so this morning's title is called Believable, okay? And I wanna ask you guys to pray with me before we get into his word. Jesus, we thank you for all that you do in our lives, God. And this morning I come before you, we come together as a body and say, speak to us. Open up your word, illuminate your word and your love and your truth in our lives this morning. And God, I, I, I ask that you would take my words, just the words of a man, and I ask that you would place your anointing upon them. And God, we know that your word is alive, and so we thank you for that. And, and God, just open our eyes and our hearts up before your word and, and before you. Draw us closer to you this morning. Strengthen and encourage our faith. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name, amen. I believe that uh, this message, if you're a believer, it's gonna encourage us, it's gonna spur us, it's gonna encourage our faith. And if you have questions, you're not sure what you believe about God or, or Jesus or about the Bible, I just wanna ask you to keep an open mind and to keep an open heart and, and consider allowing your faith to be strengthened this morning. If you guys ever given a gift, you know, especially more to um, young children, and they, you give them that gift, and you have a, a, a desire for how they might use that gift, but you know, they kind of end up playing with everything else besides that gift. Any of you guys know what I'm talking about? I wanna show you a picture of Tiffany and I, our, our youngest child, his name's Israel, and I wanted to choose a picture that I felt best described this kid, and this is, this really, I think, is the epitome. I mean, he, uh, he just keeps us laughing. And uh, a while back, one of uh, my older boys had a stuffed animal, and um, Israel always wanted that animal. And so I was out, and I bought him this stuffed animal that was similar. It was a little smaller, but it was similar to the one that he always wanted from his older brother. And I thought that he was going to be just so happy about this gift that I was giving him. But it was like, you know, he could have cared less. He could have cared less. And so when we give our kids or people gifts, we have a hope and we have a desire for how they'll use that gift. But ultimately, they're really the ones who determine what they do with that gift, right? And so I want to start out by just asking us three questions and asking all of us to consider these questions. And the first one is this, could it be that our ability to choose is a gift? Could it be that our ability to choose is a gift? Have you and I been given a gift with the ability to decide what we do with it and how we wanna use it? Here's the second question. Have provisions been made for you and I to know God? Have provisions been made for you and I to know God? And really the issue that each one of us has to settle is, is, is do we wanna know God, okay? Here's the third question. What if you began to exercise faith? Is it possible that that faith could be strengthened? Or do we spend more time trying to find reasons not to have faith than we do exercising it? So those three questions. 
Could it be that our ability to choose is a gift? Have provisions been made so that we can know God? And what if you and I began to exercise faith? Is it possible that it could be strengthened? Now, those three questions are fitting for this setting because we're all in church, right? We're here. I'm going to assume that most of us want to know more about God, maybe have questions about God, unless, I guess, well, unless you're like I was maybe uh, in high school. I one time went to a church camp solely because there was a girl there that I liked. Okay, so I understand that some of you could be here because you're trying to impl- you know, impress your lady friend. I'm, I'm saying to you, put that aside for the next few minutes and just consider the questions that we just talked about. Now, one more question. Would you be offended if I said to you that it was foolish for you to not believe in God? Would you be offended by that? And if so, don't be upset with me because it's the Bible's words. Look at Psalms 14, verse one. It says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Now there's two, uh, two uh, streams of belief that are um, similar to this, and one is atheism. An atheist would say, there is no God. Then there's agnostics. Agnostics would say, I don't know if there's a God. Now, to be fair, you and I don't know everything, right? Even though like sometimes when I'm arguing with my wife, I like to think that I do. But we don't know everything. And so for you and I to make a statement like there is no God, that would, de- that would be de- dependent upon you and I knowing everything. So being an atheist or making a statement like that, like the Bible says, is actually a foolish statement. Because you and I don't know everything. Now, you can say that you don't know if there is a God, but you can't say that there is no God. Does that make sense? So I wanna share this morning why I believe in God and why I believe that we can trust his word, trust his scripture. And the first reason is this, the Christian worldview is superior. The Christian worldview is superior. And we're gonna break this down. And really these three areas that we're gonna look at are very kind of surface level. We could drill down and go way deeper. We could, we could spend uh, a sermon on each of these three points, but we're just gonna look at kind of a, a surface level on each of these things. And the reason why I believe that the Christian worldview is superior is because a worldview, how you look at the world, a fulfilling worldview is dependent upon these, three, these four criteria. How we came to be. Okay, how did we get here? You ever wondered that? How did we get here? It's also dependent upon why we're here. I mean, what's, what's the meaning of all this? What's the reason? What's the purpose? It also must give a definition for good and evil. I mean, are there morals? Is there, are there moral absolutes? And then the fourth thing is, what happens when we die? You know, is, is, this, life, is this life it? And so a fulfilling worldview must be able to answer these four questions. And I'm, I'm gonna present to us that the Bible provides tremendous answers to each one of these, okay? So, so let's, kind of, let's kind of start with morality. And let me say this too. It's okay to have questions. I mean, I, I still have questions. It's okay to have questions and I'm not gonna pre, be, you know, pretend like I could answer all of your questions because I couldn't. I'm just simply saying to each and one of us, I'm encouraging you, hey, open up your heart. Consider the possibility that provisions have been made for you and I to know God. Okay, so let's start with this. Let's start with morality. We know that good and evil exists. I mean, we can recognize the difference. We, we understand that there's good things and there's bad things. Like Pastor Doug said, we don't have to teach our, our babies to be bad. We have to teach them to be good right? That's like, why, why in the world does Israel go and sneak in the kitchen and grab the popcorn down off the floor and spill it all over the place and start eating? Well, yeah, I understand that he doesn't un- fully know what he's doing, but you know what? There's a lot of things that that kid does that he completely understands that he's doing wrong. And he'll just look at me like, they know what they're doing. We don't have to teach them to be bad. We got to teach them to be good, I wanna share this uh, a video with you and I wanna set it up for you. I did not even know that this had taken place until I, I think weeks, months later, I found it on my phone 
This was a few years back. I've saved it all these years. Noah, who's 10 now, was like four or five at the time. Um, and I found this video of him that he had recorded on my phone. And I want you to pay attention. I, it's a little hard to hear, but I want you to pay attention and notice to the words that he's saying. Go ahead and play the video. Okay, I'm going to record me and I'm just having a good day going to a place and I think fruit and I'm calling me and I just don't want mommy and daddy to know so why would I do that because I just want to record it and I'm going to dream and I'm stuck up there. <laughs> This is totally secondary to the message, but he's recording a tree and he sees a reflection in the window of my truck up in the tree branches. And it like, his mind is like blown. Like what's stuck up there? That is the funniest thing in the world to me. But did you hear that he said, I don't want my mommy and daddy to know. And that I didn't even know that that video had taken place. I don't know if he grabbed my phone off of the counter or if my phone was in the car. I don't know how he got my phone, but he was doing something that he knew he wasn't and he was hiding. Sounds very familiar to, if you go way back to the beginning of Genesis, he was only doing the very same thing that Adam and Eve did. What did they do when they did something that they understood that was wrong? They hid. So there are clearly things that are right and wrong. And right and wrong is not based upon what you and I determine or decide, okay? Truth cannot be relative. What's right for you is right for you and what's wrong and no, it can't work that way, okay? If, if you wanna say, well, truth is relative and, and I walk up to you and proceed to take your wallet from you, what are you gonna do? You're gonna try to stop me, probably, right? Why, because you don't think it's right to steal a wallet and I maybe do. So truth cannot be Relative. We have to have clear absolutes concerning those things. And the Bible provides that. Now, I want to play another video for you. And a guy poses a question to a man named Ravi Zacharias, which I highly encourage you to read his books, go to his website. He's a master of apologetics. And the question that this guy asked him, he says, why are you so afraid of subjective morality? Or in other words, people forming their own opinion about morals. Okay, listen to Ravi's response. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Let's leave aside Christianity and historical examples for a second. All night you guys have been grappling with issues like morality and you know, what is right, what is wrong, and meaning. But my question is simply, why are you so afraid of subjective moral reasoning? I mean, do you think that we're all just gonna start raping and pillaging just because we don't have a book to tell us what to do? I mean, are you afraid of that? Like, I'm not, because that's not gonna happen. And that, yeah, Nazis were bad, but there were Christian Nazis and there were atheist Nazis. So I don't see, what are you so afraid of? Do you lock your door at night? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> Do you understand what he's saying? He said, the, the guy was asking, you know, what, why are you so afraid of people forming their own opinions about morals? And Ravi says, hey, why do you lock your doors at night then? Because if you're not afraid of people doing what they want to do, then why would you lock your door? Right? So the dilemma when we try to take that stance becomes very obvious. Truth cannot be what you and I want to believe or what you and I Determine. I like what C.S. Lewis said. He said, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. Okay? At one time he was an unbeliever. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? So you and I, when we're honest... We know that it's wrong to cheat, to lie, to steal, to murder, to uh, kill, all of those things. We understand that that's wrong. We know that it's right to tell the truth, to, to be honorable, to be encouraging, 
to, to share, to help, to provide, to be caring, okay? So we understand the difference between right and wrong. Humans do not determine what is right and wrong. We simply choose which one we'll do, okay? That's how, what it comes down to. But we live in a world that prefers to determine truth rather than live according to it. But you and I have been given a book, if we'll read it and study it, that when we begin to apply it, we will find that there is, there's a compass here. There's a, there's, a, there's a standard here that upholds and, 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 and has been sustained through the test of time. So even though we live in an evil world, this does not eliminate God's existence or his concern for the world. You know what I think it does? It highlights our resistance of him. And you might, you know, say, well, you know, I don't believe any of that because, you know, I believe that, that we evolved. I believe that we evolved. So just, you know, take all of that and, and that's fine because I don't believe that. Well, then let me ask you a question. If we're a product of time, matter, and chance, why do we react and respond to tragedy? Why aren't we just instinctual? Why don't we just continue to go about our business and, and move on like the animals do? It's because we have a soul. It's because we were created by a living God who breathed life into us, who desires relationship with us. So the reason why I believe in God and the reason why I trust his word is one, I believe that the worldview that this Bible submits to us is superior. The Christian worldview is superior. The second reason I believe is, is the Bible is superior. The Bible is superior to all other religious writings. Now, Islam is the, 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 the second strongest religion in the world today. Their, their, their equivalent, um, what they would use for their Bible is called the Quran. Now, it was given to a man named Muhammad over a period of 23 years. Now, I'm sharing this because it, you're going to understand here in a second. After he died, it was compiled by one man under the guidance of Muhammad's father-in-law. So the Quran was given to a man over the period of 23 years, which he recited and recited and recited. After he died, it was, they took his his uh, visions and the things that he was reciting and they compiled it into the Quran. One man did that under the guidance of Muhammad's father-in-law. Now, I wanna share some things about the Bible. This is why I believe the Bible is superior. The Bible was, a written, was written approximately by 40 human authors. Think of, think of the consistency, the, the unified message that we find throughout scripture as I'm sharing these things with you. The Bible was written by approximately 40 human authors over a period of 1,600 years. The writers were diverse. I mean, some of the writers that were used to write the scripture, one was a rabbi, the one was a king, a shepherd, a tax collector, a fisherman, military leader, a, a medical doctor, various writers. It was written on three different continents in three different languages. Yet there is one unified message that is woven throughout scripture. And I believe that is a tremendous reason for you and I to believe the Old Testament and the New Testament is the unity throughout each and every book concerning its message and its purpose. Think about that. How could that even be possible if there was not, it, when we read the Bible, it's easy to assume and to think that there was one author, which there was, a divine author, God, but he inspired, he God breathed. Second Timothy says, this scripture is God breathed through 40 different men on so over 1600 years on three different continents in three different languages. And God is still able to get his message to remain consistent through the course of time. The consistency contained within scripture is strong evidence for a divine author. 
So you, you take into consideration the unified message. And then let's just throw, throw in the prophecy of Scripture, okay? Biblical prophecy is God announcing events before they occur, both to a current generation and for those to come. Now, I want to just give us a few prophecies concerning the life of Jesus. There's even non-biblical texts, manuscripts that, that, that speak of Jesus being on the earth outside of the Bible. But here are some prophecies contained within scripture that Jesus completely fulfilled in his life, death, and resurrection. Okay? He would be born in Bethlehem. Okay? This was in the Old Testament. Uh, it was prophesied in Micah. He would heal. He would ride a donkey to Jerusalem which we read about in the New Testament. He would be betrayed for money. He would rise from the dead. Now, whether you believe in Jesus or not, ask yourself, how could men who never knew Jesus over this vast period of time in different places, different languages, how could men who never knew Jesus proclaim with such accuracy events that would occur within his life and through his life? Well, the Bible clears up this mystery. Look, look at 2 Peter chapter 1. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. It wasn't, it's not a work of man. This isn't something that a man could do. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the prophecy of Scripture is yet another thing that makes the Bible superior to other <clears throat> religious writings. Now, we'll look at this last one. The quality of Scripture, okay? Now, this, this, there's a reason for this. I want us to, to look at the amount of biblical <clears throat> manuscripts compared to other ancient writings, okay? And, and we're going to look at uh, the time that they were recovered from the time that they were written. Okay, and this is... This is um, <laughs> this matters, okay? Aristotle, his writings, he was, a, he was a Greek philosopher. His earliest record of his writings that we have is 1,400 years old. <clears throat> and the number of copies that have been recovered is 49. Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars, um, <clears throat> which is, a, which is a, a list of writings about his Roman military campaigns, 1,000 years old, the earliest copy. And we've recovered 10 of those. Pliny's history, which he was another philosopher and he was a military commander in the Roman Empire. This Pliny's history is essentially an encyclopedia. The earliest copy that we have is 750 years old and the number of copies recovered is seven. Now, Homer's Iliad, which I don't know what I was thinking one time in high school. I saw that book on the, on the library shelf and I pulled it off and I did not get past the first page. <clears throat> It's an ancient Greek poem. I don't even like poetry. The earliest copy was 500 years old that we have of this writing. And the number of copies that we've covered is 643. Now, look at all of that. Now, now, let's consider the New Testament that we have in our Bible. The earliest copy that we have, okay, from the time that it was written, 25 years and the number of copies that have been recovered is 24,000 plus. This matters because the proximity to when the copies were written and the closeness that we have to them further support the authenticity, the, the authenticity and the accuracy of what we have before us. Compared to other ancient writings, we have, we have quality manuscripts that have been recovered. Okay, this is another reason why I believe that the Bible is superior. Yet, for some, this is the best-selling book of all time. Do you know that? This, more books of the Bible have been sold than any other book, but it's the most criticized and critiqued and attacked book that's ever been written. Listen to this. In A.D. 300, A.D. 300, the Roman emperor Diocletian ordered that every Bible be burned. So they, I mean, they, they, they tried, he believed that if he could eliminate uh, the Bible that Christianity would die. So what he set out on a task to eliminate scripture. He thought he could destroy Christianity through that. Anyone caught with a Bible would be executed. But yet, here we are today. 
Here we are today. Listen to this. There's a, there was a man named uh, Voltaire. He was a French philosopher. It, um, it has been said that he said this, that within a um, hundred years from his day, okay, he lived in the 1700s. A hundred years from my day, there will not be a Bible in the earth except one that is looked upon by an antiquarian curiosity seeker. Basically, he's saying, you know what? A hundred years from now, this book's only going to be in a museum. Yet we have it on our phones. We have it in our homes. We have it on our laps today. It's being distributed and published all over the world. I like what Ravi Zachariah said. He said, repeatedly, the Bible rises up to outlive its pallbearers. What a powerful message that God has given to us that we might know him, amen? So the Christian worldview I believe is superior. I believe that the Bible is superior and the third reason is God's love is superior. Other religions are a pursuit of man trying to get to God. But when we read God's story and message to us, it's, it's quite the opposite, it's totally different. It's God's message of him pursuing us. It's totally different. Other religions are a list of do's and don'ts and, and actions, but that's not, I mean, we can get religious about Christianity too, but this is about a relationship. Totally opposite. I mean, and it would only make sense for a God who tells us what to do and for a God who tells us how to live to model that very same thing. And that's exactly what he did through the life of Jesus Christ. God's love is a, lo uh, is a love of mercy, of self-sacrifice, of grace, of forgiveness. His love should be and is the standard, but yet it's, it's so uncommon. It's so uncommon in our world today. Why? Because we live in a world that, that wants to decide for ourselves what we wanna believe and what we think is right. Even though, even though we know what's right and wrong. The Bible, the Bible teaches us. This is my heart, this is my prayer for us this morning. Turn to Ephesians 3, verse 16 through 19. It says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. His love is superior. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge it goes beyond our understanding. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That's, that's, I pray that this morning that an understanding of God's love would begin to just resonate within our heart. I pray that as those of us that are believers that we would just go all the more assured in our lives and in our walk and as we lead our families and in our, the, the workplace that we'd be assured and that we serve a God who's living and who's with us and who's given us a consistent and clear message and who will never leave us nor forsake us. And we've covered some logical and reasonable conclusions as to why we can believe God and why we can trust his scripture. But for some of us, listen, at some point, there is a step of faith that you take. There's a step of faith that you take. Not, not, not a leap, not a leap of faith. It's a step of faith. Not a blind step of faith into, into just darkness and, and, and I hope so's. It's a calculated decision. We just shared all kinds of, of reasonable conclusions and, and logical thoughts to why we can believe scripture. But I also wanna tell you that I believe in God because he's, he's changed my life. He saved me, he set me free. He's, he's taken what was dead and, and, and breathed life into me. Life that this world can't take away. 
2 Corinthians 5, verse 6 through 7 says, Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, listen, this, you and me, we're flesh, we're blood. We are away from the Lord, listen, for we live by faith, not by sight. We live by faith, not by sight. So we've, we've looked at some things. We've, we've looked at how uh, the scripture is consistent with history. I mean, again, we've looked at things on a pretty high level, but how scripture is consistent with history, how it's in agreement with truth, and how from the beginning to the a- end, as you turn page to page to page to page, it's all converging into one message, into one man. Jesus Christ, it's pointing us to him. God's way of restoring our relationship with him. He wants our relationship with, restored with him. Not broken, not severed, not a life where we're living broken and frustrated and angry and confused and hopeless, but a life that has been restored into right relationship with him. Acts 4 verse 12 says, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. There's no other name. Remember how I said, is it possible that our ability to make decisions and to choose is is a gift? You guys remember that? I believe that God's gift to us of, 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 of allowing us to choose is one of his greatest demonstrations of love. Our ability to choose. I mean, how do, how, how do people know that you love them by the choices that you make? Even though you could do wrong, even though you could speak evil, even though you could decide to be grumpy and maybe we do wake up grumpy, but my wife knows that I love her when I choose to do things that are opposite of what's wrong and hurtful. Love isn't based upon what others do, but what others, but what is right, right? So even God in doing what he did, well, God, you know, God, God sent his son even knowing that some would reject him. Why would he do that? That doesn't even make sense because that's not what love is based upon. Love is, love is doing what's right regardless of how people respond or what they do. That's how we understand love. And so this morning, I don't know all of us, but I, I, I do want to say that God wants to give each and every one of us the opportunity to respond to his love, to respond to his love by taking a step of faith. I want us to just stand to our feet, to take a step of faith and place our faith in Jesus Christ. And so as we've, we've talked about the things that we've talked about, we've, we've considered God's word, we've looked into scripture, I want to, I want to ask I wanna ask each and every one of us this morning, are you at a place right now where you know, you know, one of the works that the Holy Spirit does in our life is he draws and convicts us that we might turn to God? Is the convicting work of the Holy Spirit taking place within your life right now? If that's you, I wanna ask you to raise your hand. Right now, you're saying, I wanna give my life to Jesus. Keep it up, amen. Guys, let's put our hands up for these people that are raising their hands. Who else? Raise your hand up in the air. I'm not gonna embarrass you. You can put your hands on anyone else. You, want, you say, you know what, I, I, I need to respond to the convicting work of the Holy Spirit and give my life to Jesus Christ by placing my faith in him. Amen, well, here's what we're gonna do. Prayer team, altar workers, please come forward.